Good morning and happy Thanksgiving. Uh, welcome to Mount Sinai Medical Center. Today is November 26, 8 to 15, Eastern Standard Time. Um, today we're going to have an interesting case. Um, on my right side, we have Dr. Vishal Kapoor. He's going to be our co moderator for this interesting case. Let's go to the lab. Um, Prakash, are you ready? Hi. Good morning. Hi, Dr. Kapoor. How are you? Hi, good morning. Um, well, uh, you know, we have a really interesting case today for you guys. Um, it's, a, it's a case that really kind of uh, reflects uh, an advancement in our field, and we're very excited to say uh, what's going on. Forgive me for being blocked out. So I, I, I want to present the case in a second, but before that, I'd just like to introduce our crew. Um, as you know, Dr. Kapoor and Dr. Wiley are not here. Dr. Deng is on a vacation, so they're going to moderate. And we've got uh, Dr. Bosco Persoltum. Pers who's our endovascular fellow, Dr. Ray, or, or Ray Lascano, our endovascular MP. And we've got uh, um, Elizabeth and, and, and Ricardo, who are uh, obviously essential members of our team. Uh, we're very happy to present this case, and I'm going to ask Dr. Prashotam to go ahead and, and, and present this case. Can we have the slides up, please? Yeah. So today we have a 68-year-old gentleman with uh, lifestyle-limiting uh, claudication involving his right lower extremity. Uh, and uh, he failed the exercise uh, therapy as well as uh, celastazole uh, treatment. So he has a medical history significant for peripheral arterial disease with uh, multiple interventions, which uh, I'll go over it a little later. Uh, he has a history of uh, carotid artery disease for which he underwent uh, surgery. He has a known coronary artery disease and a an, uh, coronary intervention of his uh, right coronary artery. Also significant for hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia. His medications are aspirin, Plavix, Celastazole, Coreg, Atrovastatin, Losartan, Flomax, Metformin, Glimipiride, Lipizide, Isam, and Finisteride. Uh, he's an ex-smoker, and uh, there's no history significant for alcohol or drug abuse. So his uh, physical examination, his vitals were quite unremarkable, uh, and um, his distal uh, pedal pulses were uh, not very well palpable. So in the last few months, he's underwent uh, right distal common iliac uh, and uh, in junction with the proximal external iliac uh, PTA and stenting. Then he had a left SFA hysterectomy, and then uh, also he was having rest pain, so he also had a left uh, proximal TPT trunk uh, uh, angioplasty. And then I think Dr. Krishna will go over the current uh, angiograms. Okay, if we can come back here rather than the slides, uh, uh, just to our AV team, come back to the live angiogram. So, so Dr. Wiley and Dr. Kapoor, we, we have a patient here who's, uh, who's a classic Rutherford three claudican. Um, and uh, as you can see, he's a vasculopath, has uh, you know different areas of um, uh, at global atherosclerotic person who's got different areas of obviously uh, uh, involvement of the, both the coronary, the, the cerebrovascular, and the peripheral vascular bed. He, on, on his right side, he basically has Rutherford three claudication. Uh, his uh, rest pain was resolved after our colleague fixed his uh, his left TPT because that was a single vessel at that on that side and, and improved inflow. So on the right side, since he had the right common iliac lesion, for those of you at home, what, what we decided to do initially was to, to, to open the inflow and put him on an exercise program with, with maximum medical therapy. The patient has been on that for about two and a half months and has not done well with it, very frustrated with the recurrent symptoms that he's having. <coughs> so, so we went ahead and brought him back and, and, and are now going to intervene on this particular lesion, which I'm going to describe to you. So as you can see that, that he has diffuse atherosclerosis um, uh, throughout his entire arterial bed um, uh, with, with, with a significant uh, lesion of his, of his uh, right superficial femoral artery, which is actually quite long and diffuse, not really occlusive. The reason we called it a CTO was we had done a sheet shot at the time that we had done the, uh, the, uh, uh, the runoff uh, <coughs> at the time of the external iliac intervention, and it looked there was r no flow. So we, had, we thought it was a CTO, but clearly you can see it's not a CTO, and, 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 it, and it's a lesion that's quite diffuse and quite actually challenging and interesting in today's landscape. So if you look at the runoff, uh, you can see here the, 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 the runoff has a, a, a single vessel runoff of via the uh, perineal artery. He has an occluded uh, a posterior tibial artery and an occluded uh, 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 anterior tibial artery uh, mm -hmm. with, with the flow into the foot via a collateral into the, I believe, the dorsalis pedis, let's see. So it looks like, yes, the, dor the dorsalis pedis uh, does come back in the foot, as does some of the posterior tibial artery. So he has, he has quite diffuse atherosclerosis, and clearly <coughs> his symptoms can be explained. So for everybody at home, you know, our plan is, is going to be very, very simple here. 
I think, I think uh, you know, as most of you may know, we were the first uh, institution, and myself and Dr. Wiley and Dr. Prashotham were the first people to use the DCB in America. We were lucky enough to use it. And clearly, I think that that, that landscape has changed. So our plan here is going to be the use of the drug-coated balloon. And before we get started with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and debulk <coughs> this lesion. And we can talk a little bit about that as we go forward. But for the sake of the, 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 what we're doing today, I'm going to stop here and start working. And all of you have seen us do atherectomy, <coughs> so I don't think there's anything particular that you need to watch. However, I, do, I will let you know that as part of our protocol here at Mount Sinai, and most of you know we've gone over it over and over again. It's not, a, it's not an established protocol. It's not a guideline. But what we do is we use distal protection in, in patients who have long diffuse lesions <coughs> with single vessel runoff. Um, a anybody who has instead reach noses, even though it's off-label, uh, and it's actually uh, to, to do atherectomy, it's contraindicated to do atherectomy, but as we all know, people do do atherectomy in these particular lesions. At, at that time, we do use uh, uh, distal protection, regardless of whether we do uh, directional atherectomy, laser atherectomy, or rotational atherectomy. Any calcific lesion, uh, we do, we, regardless of the runoff, we use distal protection. And obviously, um, anywhere this thrombus makes common sense that we would use it. So in this particular case, since we have <coughs> a single vessel runoff, long diffuse <coughs> lesion, chance of embolization is high, we, are, we, we put in a filter. We know that the, uh, the, this particular filter made by one of the companies, it's, it's called, the trade name is the Spider, uh, has an indication for calcific um, uh, SFA popliteal disease. So therefore, we're using this and we find this use, useful in these particular cases. So having said that, while myself and Ray are going to work on, on this case offline, w I'm going to ask Dr. Prashodham to do an interesting presentation uh, regarding uh, drug-coated balloons, and then we'll get right into the case with, with both of you. Go ahead, Dr. Prashodham. Thank you, Dr. Krishna. Go to the slides, guys. So yeah, so uh, as Dr. Krishna was saying, that now that uh, FDA recently has approved the use of uh, DCPs in uh, femoral popliteal lesions, so it's obviously we're entering into a very interesting era into uh, peripheral arterial disease management. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about introduction about uh, DCBs and then uh, Dr. Krishna is going to talk about uh, the, uh, the DART uh, treatment. Next slide, please. Yeah, so before we get into uh, you know, the clinical use of DCBs, I think it's good to understand what it really composes of the scaffold. So you know, essentially it has a coating process, so it ensures that the drug is kind of uniformly spread all around the, uh, the balloon. And then it has an excipient, uh, which is essentially uh, required to transfer the drug into the vessel wall. So you can consider it as a vehicle. And then um, uh, you have the actual anti uh, uh or the anti restenotic drug, which is uh, paclitaxel. And then uh, finally, you have the balloon platform. So you've got to ensure that you have a, a good balloon so that you can track it through the vessel and uh, deliver the drug, because you cannot have it outside uh, the body for too long. Next slide, please. So here, as you notice that, you know, when you do the balloon angioplasty, you're actually uh, having a controlled iatrogenic uh, injury of the vessel wall. And uh, when you look into the pathogenesis and uh, look at the healing process, most of the healing, as the slide depicts, you know, happens in the first 30 days. So you essentially want your drug to act during this time. And uh, that's the whole idea. So next slide, please. So these are some of the um, kind of the pharmacokinetics of the different... Uh, uh, drug-coated balloons we have, you know, what's important to note here is that usually uh, the uh, doses range between uh, two to three as far as uh, uh, the drug goes, and all of them use only paclitaxel just because it has very favorable uh, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, especially for this use. And then you see they have different kinds of uh, uh, excipients uh, or the vehicle which delivers the drug into the vessel wall. Next slide, please. So when you transfer this into clinical data, uh, they haven't really found a, a whole lot of significant difference, you know, when using the different kinds of drug-coated balloons uh, treating femoropopliteal lesions. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So some of the factors well, which... Let's go back sorry. to the slide before. So, so you can see here, guys, so, so one thing you've got to understand with this particular slide is there is clearly um, one effect with, with DCB is that it works. So regardless of whether you look at the Levant 2 data or the impact SFA data, you can see that you have a, a discrepancy in patency, meaning that DCB is superior to PTA. 
but but the, so the question has to come up: Why is one DCB superior or, or better patency than the other DCB? So so if you look at the noticeable characteristics of of the of the, of the lesion of the lesions in the both the trials, if you look at impact SFA and and Levon, you can see there's really no major differences, whether it's baseline stenosis, or re reference vessel diameter, severe calcification, occlusions de novo, or even lesion length. So, so, so because of that, the, the, the question becomes is, there's, I, I, the, there's a likely no class effect with DCBs, and there are some differences between these DCBs that we haven't yet figured out. Go ahead, Bhaskar. Thank you, Dr. Krishnan. So, so picture, some of the factors yes, which is essential to understand how a DCB performs, you know, A uh, is durability, so that's the ability yeah. to hold the paclitaxel on the balloon till it arrives at the lesion. So essentially what it means is from the time you pull it out of the package, and then introduce it into the sheath and get it to the lesion. You want to make sure that you don't lose any drug, uh, you know, systemically or in it's the sheath. The opposite, then, uh, secondly, the deliverability. So it's the ability where uh, the paclitaxel can be deposited on the lesion uniformly. So if you have a, say, a 10 centimeter uh, nasty looking lesion, you want to make sure that all the 10 centimeters gets this drug. And we will show on the next slides that depending on the lesion length and then the calcification, this can vary. And then finally, the uptake, you know, the, the residency in the tissue long enough to prevent uh, in restenosis. So essentially, you want it to act during those first 28 days where the maximum amount of smooth muscle proliferation occurs. So Thank if I can interrupt here one second. So the durability is, uh, I want you guys to think about it as the get it there factor. So what's happening is the drug has to go from the sheath all the way to the lesion. So the, so the drug has to be durable and it has to be ability to be held on to the balloon till it arrives at the, at, at the lesion. So the deliverability is the, is, is, is the, is the leave it there factor. So you've got to deposit it. There's got to be a, a transfer of the drug into the lesion and the uptake is the keep it there factor. So it has to be there long enough. So you have to get it there, you've got to leave it there, you've got to keep it there. So if you think about it that way, that there's a lot that, that can actually uh, uh, you know, affect the performance of a DCB based on, first of all, the durability or the, or the get it there factor, the deliverability, the leave it there factor, the uptake, the keep it there factor. Go ahead. Dr. Purushutaman, uh, before so you continue. So let's look at uh, what happens when you use uh, uh, an excipient as opposed to you don't use an excipient. So this is from the SCAR registry. Essentially, they looked at uh, 919 patients uh, who were treated uh, with an excipient and then 217 patients who were treated without an excipient. Click again, please. Yeah. So when you look at the six-month restenosis, clearly you can see the taller tower, which is the one which uh, does not have the excipient, had a higher rate of restenosis. And as we remember that the excipient is the vehicle which delivers the drug into the vessel wall. So therefore, Han? if you don't deliver the drug into the vessel wall, therefore you don't have your anti uh therapy. Next. And then this is the uh, accumulated risk of restenosis over uh, 12 to 18 months. Again, once again, you know, the data holds good for a long term given the fact that if you don't have an excipient, your rate of restenosis clearly Han? does uh, increase. Han? Next slide, please. So the other factors which I consider as the extrinsic factors, you know, which influence the performance of the DCB, as we all know that uh, calcium is the biggest enemy of the angiograph. Oh. And here we see that at least, oh. you know, 30 to 50 percent of patients can have uh, quite significant calcification. And we know that uh, when you, uh, you know, inflate a balloon in a calcified lesion, you know, the expansion is oh. truly not uniform. You know, so the vessel wall, which does not have calcium, is the weaker one and therefore gives in more easily. And what happens is this is non-uniform stretching, therefore results in you know, dissection, there is uh, excessive injury, recoil, and thus you know, this translates yes, into sir. poor outcomes, and uh, especially so in uh, uh, diabetics. And I think this is important because uh, we are seeing more and more uh, of these patients in our lab. Next slide, please. So this is uh, what happens uh, depending on the lesion length. Uh, despite using uh, DCB, and clearly you can see uh, on the x-axis is your mean lesion length, and on your y-axis is your primary patency. So therefore, as your lesion length increases, you know, your primary patency stops to drop down. Next slide, please. So this is the uh, current scene with the DCBs. When you look at the 12-month and the 24-month uh, patency, you know, the two big trials in the Levant and in the uh, IMPACT uh, SFA. And in the Italian registry, clearly you can see that the DCBs are doing 
really well when compared uh, uh, with the uh, uh, standalone balloon angioplasty. But again, you can also see that, that there is a clear difference between the DCB technology whether it's uh, w whether it's uh, you know uh, the dose or the excipient or the or whatever it may be, th there seems to be a difference going on here. So, which is interesting to see wh where where we end up. Go ahead. Next slide, please. So, this is some of the real world data. So, when you look at uh, the data from the LEAPIG as well as from Dr. Zellis, and uh, you look at uh, the treatment of uh, DCBs uh, in these long lesions, uh, <coughs> they have uh, real good uh, twelve month patencies. And interesting also, when you compare it to uh, uh, the DES arm, it almost has comparable or slightly uh, better uh, uh, result it's than the DES. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Well, wait, hold on. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. I, just wanna wanna I just want to make a comment here. So, you know, one of the criticisms of all these trials are always going to be about the lesion length, right? Everybody's going to say um, it's not a lesion length. I already can see Dr. Wiley's mouth getting ready to say that to me. But, 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 the, but the truth of the matter is, as we know, these trials are conducted, you know, in, in, in order for the, for, the, for the fact that in order to get approval, as well as to show that they're, they're efficient. But clearly, we have data here. Yes, albeit single center, uh, but clearly reproducible, as you can see, in two different centers in Germany, which clearly show that, uh, that, that, that in long lesions, and nobody would argue that a 24-centimeter that, 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 that uh, lesion is short or a 19-centimeter lesion is short. So clearly that, that data is available. Go ahead, Bud Boss. And then you look at the uh, segment of uh, uh, disease which involves instant restenosis. Uh, we have the uh, debate ISR study which showed a 12-month patency of 81%, which uh, you know, when compared to the uh, PTA group was far, far superior. And also oh. when you look at the, all the other different modalities, I think an 81% in the DCP group is uh, very, very encouraging. Uh, <laughs> next slide, please. And now, when you look at uh, how calcium affects the, uh, uh, the clinical uh, efficacy of these uh, DCBs, so you see the blue line is uh, the primary patency, and the orange line is the uh, late lumen loss, essentially the amount of restenosis. And as the grade of calcium increases, which you see on the <coughs> uh, bottom of the graph, you know, which uh, as the quadrants of calcium increase, you can see that the uh, restenosis or the late lumen loss increases, and the primary uh, patency drops down, and this was seen in trials, you know, with... Well, uh, well, let me just make a comment. This is a very elegant study by uh, Fabrizio Finelli, who comes to our conference almost every year, uh, clearly showing that uh, the effect of calcium. So what he did was he, he, uh, he actually went ahead and did a grade of the calcium according to CT, uh, grade 1 to grade 4, as you can see. And, and you can see very, very clearly, uh, you know, that, that the, the higher calcium results uh, results in late lumen loss and a lower 12-month patency bringing up the question of whether this is going to be an Sorry. area where, where DCBs are not going to do well. Next slide. So these are some of the uh, next frontiers where uh, DAB might have a significant impact. So, you know, when you looked at some of the studies done uh, in the impact uh, amphiron deep study, uh, which was recalled in uh, December last year, essentially uh, they did not find uh, a significant difference between the uh, standard PTAs and compared to the, uh, the drug-coated balloon. In fact, they found a slightly increased trend towards amputations uh, in the uh, DCB group. And uh, as you can see, the uh, tabular column with the primary efficacy and safety, uh, there wasn't a significant difference in the efficacy, but uh, the primary safety was a concern which uh, led to the study as well as the balloon being recalled. Dr. So Dr. Uh, Shuterman, why, why, why do you think of that? Well, well you, know, you know, as you know, Dr. Wally, uh, we're going to come back to this at the end when we talk, is that I wanted to present the data, but as you know, that they, they, were, they were obviously some uh, questions about embolization, flaking of the drug, especially on that particular balloon, which is not the balloon. I want to be very clear that's available in America. It's a, total, it's a different balloon. So therefore, the coding process was different. Everything was different. So, but, but then if you, you, th there have been other trials in Europe that have shown um, you know, uh, efficacy, but however, the randomized trial did not. Uh, so one of the next frontiers, as Dr. Bosker is going to talk about, is, is this. Go ahead, Dr. Bosker. Go to the next slide. Next slide, please. So these are some of the new uh, trials which are uh, kind of upcoming, and then probably enrollment has already started. Uh, the Levan BTK study and the BEST uh, CLI study. I think it will be interesting to see what these uh, uh, study results show. And as Dr. Uh, uh, Christian was mentioning, 
And some of these studies are going to use the Lutonix uh, drug coated balloon, which is currently the approved one in this country. Next slide, please. Wait, wait, wait. The Lutonix drug coated balloon is approved for SFA use. Femoral popul right. popul popul popular. Femoral popular is not for BTK. Yeah. So currently, yes, the, there's, the, there's a, a, a study right now, which is a randomized control ID study that's ongoing in the US, Europe, and Japan. Uh, so that's we're enrolling very well. And obviously, you have the best CLI study also ongoing. Next. So this is the other interesting uh, you know, phase where drug coated balloons are entering, especially in uh, AV axis. And this is very, very early data. And uh, you can see that there is an indication that uh, DCBs uh, might be having a more uh, uh, useful role or might be better than just standalone uh, angioplasty in AV access. Is that right, Dr. Uh, Krishna? Well, you know, uh, th this is interesting because they, if, if you look at the AV access, you know, they're, they're looking at all different fun frontiers in, in which this may help. Uh, obviously, AV access has high, re high resinosis rates, and, uh, and this is an area that's being explored as is instant resinosis. There are trials ongoing regarding instant resinosis and real-world registries regarding, um, re regarding long lesions as well uh, as part of all these uh, different companies and these different trials that are ongoing. Okay, so we're going to stop there with this particular one. And, and what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and show you where we are in this case. And we'll open up a little bit of time uh, for record, guys, Davis, uh, a little bit of time for discussion. So <coughs> Dr. Wiley, Dr. Kapoor, before, before we start uh, with our discussion, I just want to tell you what we did do. We record the IVUS, please. So what we decided to do was we decided to do atherectomy on this lesion. And our, our plan is to do a drug-coated balloon after atherectomy. And I'm just going to talk about what, our, what, what it'll be. And I just want to show you the angios before you, you guys start talking. Go ahead, go ahead Jose. Why don't you uh, start talking? I'm going to show you the angios as we do the IVUS. Yeah, what type of atherectomy you use? Well, we use the directional atherectomy, and Dr. Wiley. I mean, uh, uh, it's not prohibitive calcium by any means. I would say that it's a, if anything, it's just mild calcium <coughs> that we have. <coughs> the re the reason we decided to do atherectomy was because it's a long, long lesion, and and uh, and you can see that the lesion length here is around maybe 200 to almost 300 lesions. And uh, but there's some data from uh, Dr. Zeller. It's not convincing, but however, which I'm going to present later on, uh, the dark data, he was kind enough to give us uh, his slides, okay, where we're just going to talk a little bit about where this may fit in and kind of introduce this concept of uh, atherectomy with DCB. Two things we know <coughs> from the data in Europe where it's been done more commonly is that uh, the aneurysm formation is not something to worry about. There initially, there was worry that the, you might have some aneurysm formation uh, in this particular therapy, but clearly it's not. The reason for performing atherectomy in these lesions is, is, for instance, if you have prohibitive calcium or if you have long lesions with a lot of plaque burden, will this facilitate the uptake <coughs> of, the, of, the, uh, of the drug into, into the lesion? And that remains to be seen. And I'll present the data. But let me just show you how it looks after the atherectomy. So we went ahead. And uh, as, let me just go to the slide before. So this was the lesion. So we're trying to say that at, with atherectomy, we should have better absorption of the drug rather than just uh, doing a balloon angioplasty with the um, drug-covered balloon? Well, I'm not uh, what, what, what seems to be, if, if, if you think about the thought process here, is that whether or not that's a postulation, it's a postulation right at this stage. But I do think that there is data in, in, in these type of long lesions with, with, with atherectomy out of Europe that shows that you, you possibly will be able to increase the patencies. There's no randomized control data. There is single center data with, the, with, the, with, the, with different centers in Europe that, that have shown this. So this way, I thought we could introduce this concept and talk a little bit about it. But so let me show you. This is after the first pass of atherectomy. And you can see you have, you have a beautiful uh, you know, lumen. And uh, for those of you who don't remember, because that was a long presentation, let me show you how it looked before. <coughs> here it is. Nope, that's the foot. That's the in between and right here. That's the knee. Ray's telling me all where it is. And here's, here's the lesion. So you can see it's a long, diffuse lesion with some moderate calcification, especially the mid area right there. And then you can see you have diffuse lesions all the way down below to around 30. So it's a long lesion with actually moderate calcification. Ivis also showed it that you had moderate calcification in this particular lesion. And then, and then we went ahead and did um, uh, two passes with the Silverhawk. And you can see here the first, after the first pass of the Silverhawk, this is how it looked. Right? 
And then after the second pass of the Silver Hawk, this is how it looked. And then we went ahead and cleaned up a little distally. And you can see here, that's the fi that's the after all three passes with the Silver Hawk, that's where we are. So any thoughts on, 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 uh, on what we're doing, Dr. Wiley, Dr. Kapoor? So I guess, I mean, the data on DCB is excellent, and congratulations to you and Dr. Wiley on using your DCB as the first ones. But from a clinician's perspective who's out there doing, starting to use DCB, what would be your recommendations? Meaning, how would you choose your cases, and which one you'll use DCB versus just non-coated, I mean, non-drug eluding balloons and atherectomy? Like, what would be your recommendation? Well, you know, that, that, that's a great question. I, you know, I, I, I think that, that there's, two, there's two areas. Obviously, the, the DC has been, DCB has been studied in febrile popliteal lesions, and currently they're, they're available <coughs> out to lengths of about uh, 100 millimeter balloons, 4, 5, and 6, and this is the Lutonix balloon that's available. So, so currently, you know, as Dr. Wally was saying, if you have a short 40 or 50 millimeter lesion, I think clearly at this stage, you know, uh, uh, well the, the, the therapy of choice can be just DCB straight up. Uh, you know, you, 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 can, you can obviously, you need, there's three important things about DCB that you need to remember. First and foremost is, it, is the sizing of the balloon. It's very important if, if, if you look at the, uh, the Levant data uh, that, uh, that the balloon needs to be one to one. The balloon artery ratio needs to be one to one. And uh, often our oculo measuring reflex is off. So we may think it's a six, we may think it's a five. So I think initially you need to be a little careful, make sure you get an actual balloon measurement. Second, you need to pre-dilate the lesion as, th as they did, although the data out of Europe, especially the guys who've used it a lot, like Dr. Zeller, that they seem to think that you can go ahead and just use the DCB and, and inflate it in a non-prohibitively uh, calcific lesion or whatever it may be. The third, uh, th th third will be the, uh, the, uh, the uh, resisting the temptation to stent. Because uh, if, if you look at the stent data in, uh, in the DCB trials, it's about, I think, 6% or 7% stenting in, in both the trials. So it's a very low uh, bailout stent rate. And you, can, you know that these dissections, not only from here, uh, but also from Europe, these dissections do quite well. The stenting in, in the trial was very clearly defined. It was a flow-limiting dissection with a significant gradient measured by pullback, which is a 10 millimeter resting gradient uh, measured by pullback using an end hole catheter. Now, I'm not saying you have to go to that extent, but clearly you need to make sure that this is a flow limiting dissections. Those standard dissections that we used to stand in the past are worried about, I don't think that's gonna be the case here. I think you can leave those alone and, and go ahead and, um, and, uh, and not worry about them because I don't think they will come back. So I think these are the three important points um, I want to go ahead and use the DCB here to show you guys how, how it's handled. Uh, we did a, a, for this particular case, we did an IVUS uh, measurement of, of this particular, uh, particular vessel, and it's about, what, 5 millimeters, Ricky? It's about a 5 millimeter vessel. So, so, so s since, we did, since we did atherectomy, uh, it's 5.4, five, it's 5.5, so we can use it. I'll just use a, a, a 5 millimeter balloon. Um, actually, I'll use a 6. Give me a 6 millimeter balloon. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead with a 6 millimeter 100 balloon inflate it in two areas and I want to show you guys the handling of the balloon and some of the things that you need to worry about. Prakash, um, you know, I'm a little uh, concerned that uh, in this cost containment environment uh, we have some provocative data that, that you've nicely shown uh, with uh, atherectomy prior to uh, delivering the drug eluding balloon. But the data is still not very uh, robust. Mm -hmm. uh, in what instances would you actually use atherectomy followed by drug eluding balloon versus drug eluding balloon in itself? I, th I think that's a great question. I think I think that in this in this particular area that is not clearly defined. There is no question. I think that uh, your your statement is incredibly fair. You could argue um, based on uh, oh, wait don't don't take oh you can take that out based on the, um, uh, on the, on the uh, calcium data that's available in heavily calcified lesions or moderately calcified lesions like the mid-SFA here, you, you could say you're doing atherectomy here to possibly affect the drug uptake. But if you look at the data from Lutonix and from Etronic, they do have moderate to, um, uh, moderately calcified lesions in the trial, uh, albeit a smaller number, showing that there, there, there is obviously uh, good results. So in fairness to your question, I think that the jury is out. I think it's going to be individual operator experience um, in order to decide wh wh where it fits in. But, it, but and I, th I think that's the, that's the fairest answer that I can give. So let me show you guys how to use this. So you can see here 
the particular balloon is in my hand, right? I want, I want you guys to see the balloon. So since the balloon is in the hand, you need to zoom in a little closer to me. You want to go ahead and actually take this cover off by, by moving it back and forth, right? And then, and then taking the cover off nice and smooth in, in, in a smooth manner here. As you can see, it's a little tight, and there it comes off. Do not touch the balloon. So I'm holding the balloon at the end, okay? When I introduce this, my, my, my hands are dry. I wipe my hands dry. You could change your gloves if you'd like, okay? We go ahead and, and introduce the wire in. Generally, we like to do it in an 01, um, uh, 035 wire, but obviously we have an 014 wire, and it's actually a credit to this balloon uh, that it will track on this particular wire. So w we have our glow tape. We know exactly where we want to go to. So I'm going to go ahead, and Ray's going to give me a rail in a second. N now, a um, couple of things that I want to just highlight to everyone is, as you saw, the durability of the drug getting to the lesion is fine. So we often get, get this question from people, well, you know, how long you know, do I lose a lot of the drug? Yes, the drug is lost in transit, but the majority of the drug retains in the balloon, and you're able to, to, to deploy the balloon without worrying about it. So think about how this balloon is, is actually made. The balloon is inflated, coated, and then folded. So the majority of the balloons are, the majority of the drug is in the folded balloon. So yes, you may lose some of the top part of the drug as it goes, but that's accounted for, and then, uh, and then you, go, you, you can go ahead and get it to the lesion and deploy. We recommend not to wet the balloon, because obviously it may activate the excipient, may activate the process. So that's one of the things. Second, embolization. Embolization rates with these balloons, both the balloons, even though the, uh, the impact balloon has not been approved yet, um, are clearly, clearly extremely low. It is an extremely safe balloon to use. So therefore, I think as long as you handle it properly, and get it to the lesion and put it up. Third, when you go up with the balloon, you want to make sure that, that they recommend a minimum of 30 seconds. I think, like Dr. Wiley said and Dr. Kapoor said, we're clearly learning the art of angioplasty. Nice rail here. We're clearly learning the art of angioplasty. So the art of angioplasty is, is going to be now redefined because I think we moved away a little bit from that in, 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 our, mm -hmm. in, our, in our days of not doing good angioplasty, just sort of prepping the vessel and going ahead and doing it. So here I'm getting it all the way down to about 30 is where I want it, right, Ray? Yep. Okay. A little further down than that? I thought this is good. No, I think we're good here. So we're going to go ahead here. And what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and inflate very slowly. Go up. Dr. Christian, why not uh, plain old balloon angioplasty followed by drug eluting stent there? B for followed by drug That's an excellent question. I, I, th I think drug eluting stent clearly can be used here. Uh, you know, but, but the, the beauty is if you look at the Lutonics data, you, you are, you are going to get um, a, a, a nice, uh, the, your, your TLR rates are going to be equivalent to drug eluting stents. So therefore, right now, if you, if you look at this, as you can see, this, this balloon is causing him a little bit of discomfort. We're going to go up. Keep going. No. Y you need to go up. Four. Five. Five. Six. Six. That's it. The seven. What's nominal, guys? Seven. seven. That's it. So we're going to leave it up. Go to half. So, so, so you, you can see here that uh, as we go up with this balloon, the, 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 t uh, the, TLR, the TLR rates are exactly the same as, uh, as, uh, as bare metal stents. So therefore, if you, if you compare it to also the Zilver PTX data, the, the, the rates you're getting with TLR are pretty much the same. Go so down. He's getting a lot of pain So in here. case you have a dissection, do you, I mean, you end up putting a stent, would you put a non-drug coated stand versus a drug coated stand? Is I think, there any I think if, you ha if you have a dissection, I, th I think that's, that's a very good point, Dr. Kapoor. I think, I think you should put a non-drug coated stand. At this stage, you know, putting a drug coated stand uh, is, is not uh, recommended by anyone who does a lot of these procedures. The other, the, uh, the other thing also you need to understand is that if you look at the difference between a drug coated balloon and a drug coated stand, is the uniformity of delivery of the drug. In the drug coated balloon, you have a uniform delivery throughout the vessel, while with the drug coated stand, you basically have it at the, at, at the level of uh, the struts. Now, having said that, the Zilva PTX five-year data is incredibly impressive. So, so you know, it, it's, it's something nobody has five-year data out in a randomized uh, trial, and I think we also applaud the investigators for what they did. So the beauty is we have a lot of options in these particular types of lesions at this stage. But do, do we have any data on the uh, uh, restenosis rate of a bailout, uh, bailout stenting? with non-drug eluting stents after uh, 
drug uh, coated balloon? Do we have data? There is data available. It's limited data on the randomized controlled trial that we have in America, and obviously, you know, it, you know, th th that data has yet to be teased out and published, but I'm sure it will be. But uh, but I I know that the thought is that once you put the the drug in, the the stent acts as a scaffolding is what you really want to do. That's all. Now now there's no reason. Th th the, the, there's no reason. Give me another hundred six. Then the, there's no reason to worry about uh, what is it called? Uh, um, uh, excuse me, stenting. If you have a non-flow limiting dissection, is my point. We'll see. This was this balloon looked a little big to me, even though Ivis showed it was five point six. Maybe I should have gone with a five, but I'm a big believer in the balloon artery ratio, so I went with a larger balloon. Let's see how this looks afterwards. So how long do you keep the balloon up for? Generally, Just here at Sinai, we keep it up for three minutes. The recommended uh, uh, length of time you should keep it up is about, a, is about 30 seconds at the minimum. So here now, the, the drug has been uh, deployed into the balloon, I mean into the vessel. So now I'm going to wait for this to come down, and then I'm going to walk this right back. What's your take home on uh, the Supera stent in that compartment? Well, I think I think the Supera data is, is very impressive. Again, I mean, you you have you have single center data. I mean, you have um, excuse me, registry data, but it's core lab adjudicated, CEC adjudicated, where where the data is quite impressive. So, yeah, I think that's another option that you can use. But I like the uh, the fact that we don't have to leave a mechanical prosthesis behind. Uh, and our TLR rates are very comparable. So, uh, I mean, at this stage right now, I think I'm going I'm to use uh, the DCBs in these kind of cases. I think it's important also for the, for the physicians, you know, I mean, who are worried about reimbursement and other things, I, to know that the, that the companies are, are working on getting the reimbursement, okay? So it's not that, uh, that the companies aren't aware of the reimbursement. The reimbursement uh, is a major factor, both Medtronic, which is where the the company for uh, the impact balloon and Lutonix, which is BART, um, are basically working with uh, CMS to get additional reimbursement for the balloon. So that will take time, uh, but clearly I think that, you know, the technology is available now and we can definitely impact our patients in a positive way. So as you know, uh, Dr. Christian, one of the problems that we have is that there's many patients out there that have uh, stents and their SFA. How are you dealing with uh, instant restenosis? Are you using drug eluting balloon? Are you doing a laser atherectomy followed by uh, uh, plain old balloon angioplasty? What's your algorithm? And Dr. Wiley, you're right. You know, that's a great question because you know that we did the, uh, the, the, uh, the case with the Excite trial uh, type of case, I think two months ago here. So clearly, uh, I think both are absolutely good options. Um, you know, but uh, the, the, the difference is the Excite trial is randomized control data. The, uh, go up there, guys. The Excite trial is randomized control data, and, uh, uh, which is against plain old balloon angioplasty. And uh, let me see, am I okay here? You oh, I need to come picture. back a little bit. Yep, that was the balloon picture, right? The one minus? Yeah. So if you had a 200 centimeter uh, uh, instant restenosis, uh, would you use drug eluting balloon? Uh, would I would I use drug eluting balloon for a 200 centimeter re instant restenosis? Yeah. Honestly, at this stage, it's single center data. I would I would. I w I, it would be part of my algorithm. I wouldn't say I would definitely use it in all the cases, no. But it would be part of my algorithm, absolutely. What about yourself, Dr. Wiley? What do you think? Dr. Kapoor, yourself as well. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, kind of excited with the Excite data, I think, is... Uh, wow, is, is, forgive, is, forgive the pun, huh? I'm kind of excited with the Excite data. Is, uh, yeah, right? It's <laughs> <laughs> kind of interesting. What happens is that uh, I would certainly consider in long lesions using drug-eluting balloon Fine. inside of them, yes. Okay, six. How about you? Yeah, I think uh, it'll be a good protocol. I mean, like Dr. Christian said, trying to avoid any prosthesis in the in the lumen or the artery. I mean, the approach would be to try to use drug eluting balloon and it most work. like it works, and then take it from there. I mean, if it's still there is flow limiting lesion or stuff like that, stent it. But that would probably be my second line of treatment, essentially. Well, you know, I I, I think you. you all you could also argue that you could put a silver stent inside that. That's correct. So I, I think at this stage, you know. We really don't know, and I think all this is going gonna, is, is gonna to let us know. As you know, there's ongoing trials on ISR with DCB. We're going to get data on that, and it's an incredibly exciting time in peripheral vascular disease for us to know that all this stuff is going to be coming out for us. So I think at this stage right now, look, I believe in a high balloon to artery ratio right here. The balloon looks big. Have I dissected the vessel? 
I probably have. The question is, do we leave that dissection? Do we not leave that dissection? If we choose to leave that dissection, as for the trial, we're going to follow this guy. Now, now th th so when we follow this guy and he reached stenosis, we're going to learn, at least anecdotally at Mount Sinai, that maybe we should tack up the dissections. We don't know. So I, I'm not at all, I'm very, very upfront with my patients. We let our patients know what we definitely know when randomized data, what, what our thought process is, get them on board to be part of our team in terms of taking of, of their own health, and then make a decision together. So most of our patients, uh, you know, are, are very well educated and they know that, uh, you know, stents may or may not be good for them. We've talked to them about these things. So I think, um, you know, the learning process is going to occur not only in our practice here at Mount Sinai, but everybody's practice um, in, in, in America. Down? Wait, it's not three minutes yet. But the, but the important thing to remember, and I think, I think you know, the, the points are all well made. I think Dr. Wiley made a great point about atherectomy. Why not just do DCB straight up here and leave it alone? That's a very valid argument. But I thought it would be interesting to bring up the, the thought of, of DCB with atherectomy with DCB and see where it fits in. And right after this, we're going to do the presentation of Dr. Zeller's data, which he presented at Viva, uh, as part of our lecture here with, uh, associated with this particular case. The other, the other exciting part of it is also where this is going to fit in in other areas. You know, where does it fit in in, for instance, AV a, a fistulas? I mean, uh, AV fistula. Where is it going to fit in in, um, in, uh, in, 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 in um, below knee lesions? I mean, these are areas where I think it's going to be very, very interesting. Down. What about for you, Dr. Kapoor? Where do you think DCB will fit in your practice? DCB essentially, is, I mean, specifically after seeing the data, it's pretty exciting, and I would probably try to use it short, uh, not essentially very long, but, you know, uh, focal lesions or long lesions which are not that much calcified unless I'll choose to atherectomy and then DCB. So <coughs> the way things are with the economics of the whole situation, I would try to use DCB wherever I can and then I guess take it from there. Okay. I mean, I mean uh, remember the economic data has been presented. Uh, Sean Salisbury and Dr. Cohen um, uh, did a wonderful presentation. I think Sean did it uh, for Dr. Cohen at TCT, where he talked about the economics of DCB and how, obviously, the initial index year, you may spend a few more dollars on DCB, but in the prevention of restenosis, you're really, you're really going to come out on top. So, so I think, I think you know, the economics of this will, 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 take a, will make a difference in the long run. So remember, uh, in, in my mind, I'm expecting a dissection. We're going to deal with it. We're going to see, see, we'll see what's happening, and we'll decide. Prakash, there's becoming a lingo out there that leaving a stent behind is bad. Well, why is it, what's the problem with leaving a stent behind in the mid-SFA? Uh, You're not going to bypass right into it. So interesting. So you can see here in the, in the mid, we have a little recoil. Distal, we obviously have a, a lot of uh, recoil here around 30, so which is very interesting, showing that this might have been more calcified than we thought. Go ahead, inject. Was our ACT okay here, guys? 309. Interesting, very interesting. So, so what, what I may do here is go ahead and just put another DCB distal after pre-dilling with a 5. So give me a 4-0 balloon here. Here I'm going to do what Dr. Wiley says, which is just go ahead and do a 4-0 balloon, a 4-0 regular balloon, uh, and then put a, a, a shorter DCB distally, and then we can talk about the mid-SFA and what we want to do there with that, with that recoil that we're dealing with. Go ahead, give me a roadmap here, Ray. <laughs> so what do you think about the result, Dr. Wally? What do you think about that recoil we're dealing with there? I mean, I think you, you, you have to dilate it again and per perhaps leave the balloon inflated for a little longer. I think, I think this lesion, this is very interesting because I think we're going to be chasing our tail here. You've got, you've got obviously uh, an area right, right up top where you've got a lesion, you've got another lesion in, uh, in, the, in the popliteal. You could argue it's such a focal lesion, why not just do an atherectomy in this area and just leave it with an atherectomy? What mm -hmm. do you guys think? Yeah, I think it looks diffusely diseased all the way down. Huh? It looks diffusely diseased all the way down. You're yeah, so I think correct. that's what I'm going to do. I'm right. just going to do another atherectomy. So guys, let's, do, let's get the atherectomy ready. So I think here what I'm going to do, since it's very focal type of lesions, I'm just going to do an atherectomy in these two lesions. 
and then and then just leave it. And I think I think we're going to get a nice result at the end, uh, and then we can deal with that mid area that kind of recoiled to see what's going on. Okay, it was a little s uh, slower flow, I thought. Uh, well, I think, the, our, I, think our filter, okay? I, I think our filter is full, Jose. Okay. Uh, we're going to be very careful, um, as you know, with our filter. So you're right, absolutely the flow, there was a s difference in flow. So we're going to go ahead and make sure we're very careful at this level. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead. So, you know, uh, oh guys, come on, I need a nice rail. Come on. So we're just going to go ahead and do an abstract to me. I mean, would any of you, uh, would you leave this alone, Jose or, or Vishal? No, I think would be, in, in my per personal opinion, I would uh, atherectomize it. Yeah, I think yeah. it's good to have a good outflow, so atherectomizing it will definitely help, and uh, I guess we should do that. I mean, you don't see much of dissection with the balloon itself, so that's pretty exciting to see that you went up three minutes, kept up there, so I think it's uh, pretty promising with the balloon itself, but we have to take care of the distal I'm lesion. I'm just going to do a little directional atherectomy here. Off. I'm just going to do a couple of cuts. Okay, on. Oh, forgive my hand, guys. Unfortunately, we do get a lot of radiation. I'm trying to do as good as a job as I can off. Okay, we're getting, I think I'm going to make a three quadrant cut here. Come back to either anterior or posterior. Okay. On. Are you going to do something at six, six centimeters off. also? Yep, I'm going down now. Balloon. And where's the filter now? It's down at the level of the perineal. On. Okay. Off. On. Off. On. Off. Okay, we're pretty full here. Okay. We got a lot of plaque in this particular area. So let's see what we get. Obviously, I want to be careful with that filter, as Dr. Wiley noted. The flow is not the best. What is your anticoagulation regimen? Right now, we, we're on we're on bivalrudin. Uh, for these longer cases, we tend to use it. For li live cases, we do put me on coronary. We tend to use it. Um, and your uh, your ACT, you're keeping it at what? Uh, well, with bivalvirin, as you know, we really don't check ACT. But in our lab, as you know very well, we, we go ahead and keep it around. As long as it's above 300, we know that the bi the, the the drug has entered the vessel. There you go. Yeah, so there's, there's your embolization, the filter. There. So you see that you know I it's important as as good a job as you try to do with these things, you do you can embolize. And now we'll just, as you can see, there's a little stasis of flow. So it's quite, it's, it's, it's embolized quite a bit into that filter. So we'll just go ahead and pull that filter out, give a little knife ride and take a picture here. Are you just going to pull the filter out or are you going to uh, capture, uh, partial capture? Or are you going to suck think, some of the uh, I, I debris or I think this is what? pretty good. Uh, give me a, a DSA here. I think this is pretty good, Jose. I think in ter terms of, I think we should be able to safely capture this filter. Inject. So I, I don't think that'll be a major issue. Now you can see the flow is a lot better. Much it's a ratty better. vessel. Much better. It's a ratty vessel. You know, it's not, it's not the best vessel. We all know it. But, uh, you know, we're not here into arterial beautification here. So, you know, I think, I think we're okay with this. I'm okay with leaving this. Are you going to pre-dill that recoil zone or afterwards? I, I'm, I'm going to look at it after I capture my filter because, as you know, when you have a filter that's full, the more manipulation you have, you could lose some of this debris. Right. So I'm going to go ahead very carefully capture it. So right now... We're going to go. I just want to tell, uh, tell everyone that uh, we missed Dr. Guja. He had to go back home. And, uh, you know, uh, he's in all our thoughts. He has, uh, he's in back home in India. He'll be back soon. So just a shout out to Dr. Guja if he is watching. Mega? All the way down?
see. He's coming next week, yep. So you can see here the filter is going down. I'm just going to do a partial capture here, which is just about there. So now I'm going to hold the wire, and I'm just, Ray's just going to follow me up. Follow me up, Ray. As you can see, Ray hasn't had breakfast again. Please donate, www.raylascano.org. You know? What filter are you using? I'm using the Covidian filter, Dr. Wiley. Okay. okay. And Ray will check the filter. Always bleed back the diaphragm once the filter comes out. Flush forward, guys. While you're doing that, I, uh, there's a couple announcements I got to make. The next perforate intervention case will be moved to December 17th. Yes. The next Anything? CCC live cases will be in December the 16th. Yep. Once again, I repeat, the uh, next perforate intervention case will be moved to December 17th, and the next CCC live case will be the day before on December the 16th. So we're going to take a shot of the runoff to make sure we're okay, right? Ready? We can just fill up a little bit. Okay, inject. Inject. Oh, my pedal is stuck here. There you go. Good. Good flow. We didn't lose anything. Very nice flow. Wonderful. Give me some uh, nitro, guys. How about the Good foot? Knife, right. I'm just going to take a shot here. Just look at this area. I think that recoil area distally is fine. Yeah. Yes. Yep. I think we may have to clean up that proximal area a little bit too. As you can see, that when you have these size mismatches, you start chasing, but that really looks a little significant to me. So we may go ahead and do a little atherectomy there as well. You know, the, one of the things that I'm hesitant to do and I want to talk to you guys about is the total dose of DCB, right? The total dose of DCB is around 200 at this stage. So uh, meaning a uh, total length of balloon that you can use is around two balloons and no more than 200 uh, millimeters. So, you know, there's animal data that's available out there that looks that you can use more. And as you know, the, 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 the total dose of paclitaxel that we use in this particular case is a very low. But at this current stage, uh, I'm a little hesitant at this stage with my own practice, and it's really just my opinion to use more than two. As you know, Dr. Zeller and other doctors, uh, or other doctors out there have used more than two, and, and then they feel fine. But at this stage right now, we're not at the, in Mount Sinai using more than two balloons per case. And um, I shouldn't say two balloons per case. We're not using more than 200 millimeters length per case of DCB. And what is your concern? Aneurysm formation or what? No, the, the concern is the, is the total dose uh, studied in humans. Uh, there is animal data uh, that, that's been there, but the total dose has been studied up to 200 millimeters, which was in the trial. There has not been, um, uh, there's been animal data for uh, over 200 millimeters. You can do the rest. There's been animal, animal data over 200 millimeters. So everyone at home, the rest of it is going to be pretty mundane. What we're going to do now is we're going to clean up the proximal area with the, with the atherectomy, possibly balloon, the, but we're not going to touch the rest of it. We're very happy with the rest of it. And then we're, we're once, once we're done with that, we're going to stop the case. We're going to follow up how, how we smaller. follow these patients. So two things. First, go ahead, help, help them. Well, uh, first and foremost uh, are, are antiplatelet therapy with these patients. The current recommendation for DCB with antiplatelet therapy is 30 days of antiplatelet therapy. Sa uh, with, D with DES or with the, the, the uh, Zilver PTX stent, it's three months of dual antiplatelet therapy. N number three, how do we follow these patients? This patient will get an excise ABI at one month. He'll, he'll have an ultrasound at one month so we know what his baseline is. Obviously, in this type of case with such diffuse lesions, I'm looking for velocities that I can follow. So I'm, I am, I am ex except expecting increased velocities both in the proximal SFA and the distal SFA, and I would like to document that early in this course so that when I follow this out over the next 3, 6, 9, 12, 24 months, I can see whether those velocities are increasing. I'm expecting my restenosis to occur in the areas where I atherectomize. The definitive LE data clearly shows a good patency rate, you know, in these type of lesions. But however, you know, I, I, I think at this stage, at least anecdotally, I'm thinking to myself that that's where the restenosis is going to occur. If the restenosis does occur, I want to catch it early. Uh, or if the restenosis occur in the DCB area, I want to catch it early. I want to ask two questions to you and, you and Dr. Wiley, uh, Dr. Kapoor. How are you going to deal with DCB restenosis? 
Well, I mean, that, that's a good question. That's a very good question. You know, I guess the, the first thing that I would look at is what is the mechanism of the restenosis? Is this because of uh, a dissection? If that, that is the case, I'll put a stent. The question is then what type of stent would you, would you use, a drug eluting stent or a regular burr metal stent? Well, if, you know, that's, uh, that's if I don't have a dissection, then it becomes a, a more difficult question to answer. Well, I, I got to tell you, it's interesting. Uh, if, if you look at the data out of Europe and discussing with those guys who obviously have the most experience with DCBs, uh, it's very clear that the, that the uh, the entire it's just that focal area is that the entire um, um, scope of restenosis is likely going to change. We know that DES restenosis changed, uh, you know, uh, general stent coronary stent restenosis. And what the thought process is, is that the DES restenosis or the DEB restenosis is going to be a focal restenosis. It's going to be much easier to treat, like Dr. Wally said. I don't, I, don't, I don't know whether we'll understand the mechanism clearly, but clearly it's going to be a focal restenosis uh, from the early uh, stuff that's coming out. And so I think our treatment algorithm for these may be provisional stenting, directional atherectomy, maybe, again, re-expanding the lesion and seeing what happens. So I think, I think we have a clear idea on, on uh, you know, we don't have a clear idea, I should say, at this stage on how to treat this restenosis, but I think we are getting a clear idea that the, that the restenosis is going to be different. Rather than a global diffuse restenosis of a long lesion, you're going to end up with a focal restenosis. Um, any, any other thoughts, guys? I think it's a very nicely done case and a very provocative information that you've been presenting today. Well, thank you. It's an, yeah, it's a very exciting time with using DCBs, and hopefully we'll be using more and more. And right, and, uh, and hopefully, you know, as as the as the impact data is, uh, you know, I think it's been it's been submitted for publication, and uh, I know that the Levant data has also been submitted for publication. Once the uh, the articles uh, come out, and I think once we start looking at some head to head, uh, can you cycle a cuff, guys? Well, well, once we start getting some head to head, uh, you know, even single center data, it'll be very interesting to see how these balloons perform. Uh, in our hands. As you know, the technology continues to, to, uh, uh, to evolve. We have the, uh, the Covidian platform, which has recently been sold, sold to Spectronetics. That trial, uh, that trial is going to come out with another balloon. So you can have multiple generations of balloons coming out. You, you know, know, what I think is going to be interesting is uh, trying to uh, decide if this is a cost-effective measure using a drug-eluting balloon, which is clearly uh, an expensive uh, de device, but from a cost-effective uh, analysis, perhaps may be the way to go. We don't have that da data available, but if you decrease restenosis significantly, the patient doesn't have to come again for a second or third procedure. You may perhaps you. be saving money. Well, you know, I, like I said, you have early data. Uh, uh, Dr. Tom Zeller and Dr. Michael Jaff did it for the European um, uh, side, and it was that, that was published in, I believe it was published in, uh, um, in um, CCI, uh, uh, cardi catheter cardiovascular interventions. And uh, I think the, uh, the American data, as I told you, was, uh, was presented by Dr. Salisbury at TCT. So we do have some economic data that supports, and you know Dr. Burkett, who was here, Dr. Wiley, uh, about a year and a half ago, when we did the DES case live, clearly has the, the data for uh, the, the Zilber PTX as well. So yes, there is going to be an economic data uh, impact on, with these particular devices, and I'm very excited to be part of this, uh, you know, this, I could say, this advancement in, in, in the treatment of PAD. Again, Very guys, well. we're going to sign off from here. I'd like to thank you, uh, obviously, Dr. Wiley, uh, Dr. Kapoor, for so much for your help and, and uh, making this an interesting case. I'd like to thank, obviously, our team, Dr. Bosker, Dr. Ray, or should say Ray Lascano, and, uh, and uh, Elizabeth and, uh, and Ricardo for really helping in our AV team. Uh, like Dr. Wiley said, we will be back in December. Um, December 17th. December 17th. With, uh, with, with hopefully another provocative case. We look forward to your thoughts. Please send us our emails at our Monsanto email and, and, and you know, participate with us in these teaching exercises. And we we'll really appreciate your participation. Thank you again, guys. Happy Thank Thanksgiving. You.